I want to invite you to think about something with me. Think about a time when you experienced a change in your life. Now, it could be a change that was big. It could be the, the loss of a loved one, someone saying goodbye, maybe changing jobs or having a child. It could be something small like getting new neighbors or getting a new phone. I mean, how, how does that thing work exactly? But think about a change. and Whatever it is, how did that change make you feel? And, and I talk about change this morning and, and invite us to reflect on how we experience change because I think the story of the ascension is fundamentally a story about change. I mean, there's a lot going on. This is a really rich text, but there is change that's happening. So Jesus had been the, the leader of his disciples. He had been their beloved teachers. He had walked with them for some three years. And, and he had died, and they thought it was all over there, but it turned out that even the cross, even death, could not keep him from his disciples. He had rose from the dead and come to walk among them again and to teach them again and to show them the meaning of God's coming kingdom. But here he leads them out of Jerusalem. They go to Bethany, this community of Bethany, and he blesses them and is taken up into heaven. And their relationship to him changes. Their encounter with Jesus changes in that moment. They know he is not going to be with them in the same way. And so it is a story about change. And what I hope we can hear this morning is that in times of change, Jesus is the same. Because that's one thing that really the, the disciples begin to learn in this moment. <clears throat> they, they learn that even though Jesus is going to be at the right hand of the Father, that he has ascended into heaven, that he is still present to them in the ways that matter most. And he, he brings up again that promise of the Holy Spirit that will be poured out upon them. They're to wait until they have been clothed in power, until they have received his power in Jerusalem. But it's a story about change. And when change happens to us, Jesus is the same. And we got to keep coming back to him and be grounded in his life. Now, now look at this passage with me here in the Gospel of, of Luke. He, he leads them out to Bethany. So it's after his death. It's after his resurrection. He spent some time with the disciples. He's appeared to them in the upper room. And then he takes them out. He's their leader even at this moment. right? He's leading them out of Jerusalem to Bethany. And then in verse 50, notice what he does. He lifts up his hands and he blesses them. And then verse 51, while he is blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. So he blesses them. And this, this the ascension that Jesus leaves, leaves earth in the bodily form and is taken up into heaven, you know, it was always something that kind of, it got me a little bit. Like, what, what, what exactly is going on? I never could quite wrap my head around it and you know, I kind of always imagined sort of this Sunday school play where, where someone's got like, a, you know, a, a, some straps on them and, the, and somebody's pulling them up and Jesus is kind of herky-jerky going up into heaven and hid by a cloud. And I was always like, what, what would this look like? What would this be? And theologically, you know, I was even kind of trying to imagine it like, well, if, if Jesus is the Emmanuel, God with us, if Jesus has come to be God present to us and to teach and to, to heal, then what does this mean, that God is being removed from us, sort of the de-incarnation, that, that God is no longer present? But I think it's interesting to notice what the disciples experience here in this change. They, they look at how they react, verse 52 and verse 53. Verse 52, the first thing they do is they worship him. So it's, it's responsive praise. Jesus ascends, and they don't, they're not despondent. They don't start weeping, even though I'm sure that they felt this torn part of their hearts, but they worship him. And in fact, in the Gospel of Luke, this is the first time where the disciples worship Jesus. And Luke has chosen his words very carefully because Luke wants to point out that it's at this moment that the, the, the full character of Jesus is revealed, that now he is at the right hand of the Father, sharing in God's rule. And they worship him, and they return to Jerusalem, and notice how they return with great joy. So they're not sad that he's gone. They're returning with great joy, and they stayed in the temple continually, and notice what they're doing at the very end of the gospel, praising God. So 
worship, joy, praising God. And Jesus doesn't leave them as kind of, sorry, I got to go. He leaves blessing them. And part of the meaning of the ascension is that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for all of his people, for the whole world, blessing us from that place of power. And so this is, in so many ways, a scene that is a positive scene, where where Jesus is uh, changing the relationship with the disciples, but not breaking it, not giving up on his commitment to them, not letting them go or releasing them from their mission, but saying it's going to be different, it's changing, but what matters is that I am still with you in the ways that, that count. And so Jesus goes to the right hand of the Father. And I, I still don't know quite what that would have looked like. You know, I, I, I think, well, could it have, would it have been sort of this, this visionary experience where he's, he's present to us, but then we, we perceive that he is up in, in the sky, that he's at the right hand of the Father? I don't know. But it's, it's a, a, a metaphor as much as uh, something that they are seeing, that he is no longer simply present to them on earth, but is at God's right hand, is with God on the throne, as we see in the book of Revelation. It's talking about who Jesus is. It's more than just what they see. And so here, here we have Jesus, who is changing the relationship with these disciples, but at the same time coming back and assuring them of, of everything that is going to say the same. That, you know, in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 28, verse 19, he says that I will be with you even to the end of the age. And here he's blessing them. He's not saying good luck. He is blessing them. And the disciples aren't releasing them. They are worshiping him. It's this story of change, but at the same time, things staying the same. And, you know, we are in a moment of change in the world, in our society, in the church, maybe especially in the church. It's a time of change. And there's a part of us, I think, that knows that the church has always got to change, to be looking at how we can authentically adapt to new realities. So, for example, in our congregation, long ago, we spoke German, but now we speak English, And we're always, I think, looking to speak the gospel into our current reality, into our culture, into our community in a way that matters in people's lives. And and that is a change. We want people to be able to hear and understand the meaning of Jesus' words in their lives. And the gospel never changes. Jesus never changes. Our basic identity in him never changes. We belong to Christ but yet we are learning to articulate the gospel in ways that are are new, that sometimes are different, in ways that are changed. But at the same time, I think there can be ways that sometimes people say, well, everything's got to change. Nothing can stay the same. And sometimes people articulate this in terms of church survival, that if you're going to survive as a church, everything has got to change. And that doesn't feel right to me either. I think sometimes we've got to just be at peace with who we are. And you know, people can say, you got to change your music, change your look, change the clothes that you wear, change the food that you eat at your potlucks. Somehow the church is supposed to undergo this massive transformation. And there's even a book out there on church revitalization that's called Everything Must Change. But I don't know how that can always work, I think a little bit about one um, yearly event that we had in the community where we lived in Washington State, and out there, there in eastern Washington, it's pretty dry, so you've, the only bodies of water are these pothole lakes, and then these irrigation canals that they call coolies, and every year for Warden Community Days, which is kind of like our Black Kettle Festival, they would have a cardboard boat race, if you can imagine this. Now, cardboard and water, think about how well those two go together. Cardboard boat race. Um, And so people would would try to cobble together boats. It always happened on Sunday morning, right? So um, I didn't get to see firsthand the boats sinking, but I got to see the boats being brought out as people were were bringing them down to the race. And and you see these cobbled together boats, you know, some people um, using plastic milk jugs, kind of whatever they can grab to try to construct something 
that's going to float. And the problem is you can never test these things because as soon as they hit the water, then they're already starting to fall apart, right? So yeah, there's no going back to the drawing board, right? Because once it's in, it's, it's done. And I think sometimes that we can get to this place kind of like a cardboard boat race in the church. I just mean the church, not necessarily our congregation. We're, we're grasping for whatever we can find. Where people are telling us, you've got to change everything. And we're, we're pulling together, you know, pieces of this, pieces of that, and hitting it on the water, trying to build a raft as we're sailing. And I'm not sure that it always works the best. The question is, for me, how do we change? And do, do we change in ways that ground us more deeply in Jesus. Because this is what it's really about. It's about coming back to Jesus who does not change. And in Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. I bet many of you know that, that passage. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is him who has ascended to the right hand of the Father. I mean, Jesus is the one who, when the boat is stormy, says, peace, be still. He's the one who's centered and grounded. When people are sick, Jesus is the one who says, be healed, and he puts things to right. Jesus is the one, when, when people are tormented by demons, he says, be free. He's at the center. He's holding it together. He's the one who never changes, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. In times of change, Jesus is the same. But this is the thing about change. Change happens. Kids grow up and go out. People pass on. We change jobs. We change houses. I mean, change is a reality. And the problem isn't so much change, which is inevitable in some ways, but what kind of change because you see, there can be good change. You know, we can, we can get a raise. We can um, uh, be healed from some illness. We can have reconciliation in a relationship that was broken. Those can be very good changes that we welcome. And I think the fact, the, the, the fear that we have most often as human beings is not change as loss. I think people don't so much fear change as they fear loss. At least, that's what I've experienced in my life. I mean, most of us like change when we get something better out of the deal, but we're afraid of what we might lose. And you know, loss is something that's very hard to define because it's not just tangible things. It's not just less money or less space or less time. But loss can also be this sense of, of losing something that is deeply valuable to us. So, we, we fear the loss of something that matters to who we are, to our identity. One writer, Carl Dudley, talks about um, change in the church, and he speaks about an elderly gentleman who would always sit in the same place every Sunday in the same pew. And some of you know what I'm talking about, right? Like there's kind of a, there's kind of a landscape in the, in the sanctuary. People have their, their place that they sit, and that's, that's nothing wrong with that. But when asked why did he always sit in that same place, why was that so important to him to sit in that pew, the elderly gentleman talked about how he remembers sitting there with his son. And his son is not there anymore. His son had gone to Vietnam and not come back. But when he sits in that same place, it is like his son is sitting there with him. And for me, there, that's, that's what, we can't always articulate those things. We can't always notice what it is that, that people experience as loss, what the fear of change is. But sometimes there are those deep values, that, that fear of something being lost that's important to them. You know, this is why it's hard to move, to change houses. We have memories that are attached to a place. We fear change that leads to the loss of those memories. You know, I think it's like this with personal change, too, with our personal lives. I mean, change is hard. Think a little bit about medicine. And, you know, there are studies that, that show that people, when they've got some kind of a health condition and are told by their doctors that they've got to make a life change, you know, the typical things, right? More veggies, less red meat, more exercise, that kind of thing. There are studies that show that so many people, when they're given changes that they need to make in order to survive, 
don't do them. And I don't know what that says. I mean, it's, it's human nature, right? But I mean, does that say that we prefer death to change? Um, sometimes I wonder. But in this passage that we see here at the Gospel of Luke, look at, look at the disciples. I mean, look how they ex- accept this change of their relationship with Jesus. Look what happened to them. I mean, they're losing their friend. They're losing their teacher. But then they return with great joy. And they don't weep, but they worship him. And they're praising God in the temple. The disciples ground themselves in the unchanging God through worship. And it doesn't mean they weren't sad. And it doesn't mean they weren't shaken up or wondering what was going on. But they go back to the temple and they're worshiping God. They, They hold to their faith even though Jesus isn't with them, they, they, they believe that he is still present to them. And in times of change, Jesus is the same. And here's the thing. I think the problem isn't change, but the fact that we hang on to things that aren't going to last. Change happens, and I think that we can best deal with change and embrace change when we keep coming back to the unchanging God in worship. So when we are grounded in God, then we have a little bit of a perspective when things change around us, right? And you see worship in this passage. You know, I pointed this out. At the beginning, he's blessing them. It's an act of worship in 50 and 51. In verse 52, they worship him and return to Jerusalem with great joy. In verse 53, they're at the temple, the place of worship. And they are praising, which the, the word literally there, and some of your translations might say, the word is blessing God. He blesses them, they bless God, which is to say they, they praise him, they give glory to God. It's all this language of worship. And so in this moment where everything is shaken up, they go back and ground themselves in God through worship. And there's one, there's one other word here, and I love this because I think it's so beautiful, that word for lifted up in verse 50, he is or um, in verse 51, he left them and was taken up into heaven. He's lifted up into heaven. There's a lot of words that can be used in New Testament Greek to say taken up. And Luke chooses a very special one there. It's a word that means offered, as in given offering. It's the same word that gets used back in the book of Leviticus to talk about offering to God a, a sacrifice of an animal or grain or the first fruits. And so Jesus is offered up to God. His whole life, his teaching, his presence, his death, his resurrection, it is all one offering to God. And I think the disciples, even they, they sense that, that Jesus' life is being offered to God and that through him they can offer their lives as well. It's the completion of Jesus' life. And I wonder, I wonder if, Maybe what helped the disciples get through this moment of change was recognizing that they could deal with it as an offering. I mean, they saw Jesus' life as offered to God, and maybe they then saw that they can offer their lives to God through him. So think about this with me. What if we evaluated change not by what we might lose, but how that change might better allow us to offer our lives to God. So how can a, does a change allow us to more fully offer our lives to God? When something's different in our lives, can that be a, a moment where we offer up our time, our talents, our belongings to God? Can we worship God in ways that are beautiful and engaging? Can we reach out better and make disciples and welcome people onto the journey of faith? Can we grow as a caring and sharing congregation? Do our lives become an offering through change? So are we grounded in God who's unchangeable? And can our lives be an offering? And you know, this is, this is really a way of making our lives an act of worship, of grounding ourselves in the unchanging God. Because you see, change is not always lost. Change can also be an opportunity for offering. And I think this is especially the case when we think about the church. Does any change allow us to offer more of ourselves to God? And we've had a lot of changes in the last three odd years. You know, we've, we've made changes to our physical plant. <clears throat> we've brought in a new constitution. We have worked together to make some important changes in our life together as a church. 
and there's going to be more. That's the reality, that we will continue to seek to be faithful to what God is calling us to, and sometimes that will mean change. And on each of those occasions for change, maybe one way to think about it would be to say, does this allow us to better offer ourselves to God? You know, each change can be that opportunity for offering. And I think the same thing can be said about our personal lives. Does a change in your personal life allow you to better offer your life to God? If you move, if you get a new job, whatever it is, does that allow you to offer yourself better to God? What if our evaluation of change was based not on what we lose, but on what we can offer? You know, I think about this a little bit when we, we think about worship and keeping God at the center, because it's in times of change that we most need to come back to him. And I think one of the ways that we do that is say, God, I offer this change to you. I offer my life up to you afresh. And you know, it's in times of change when we got to keep grounded in him. Sometimes people, when they're really busy, will say, you know, I don't have time to pray or I don't have time to worship or to study the scriptures. I don't have time for church. But I'm not the first one that has noticed that that's when we need to go back to God most intensely. When we say we're so busy, I mean, I remind myself I'm too busy not to pray and I think those are the moments when we, we, we find God's provision for us. And I'll tell you, when I was younger and, and graduated from college and took off to live in the big city and didn't know anybody, and one of the first things that I did was find a church. And that's part of how I'm wired, but it was also because I think I had this deep sense of needing to be grounded and to find a way to make sense of all the changes that were happening in my life. And this is what we need to remember. In times of change, we need to remain grounded in the unchanging God. And we do, this, we do this through worship. We do this through prayer. We do this through scripture study. We do this by bringing to mind and remembering that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. And here's the disciples. They, they do just that, both in this passage and then later in, in the book of Acts, where we Continue the story of the disciples. They are in Jerusalem, breaking bread and praying together and learning more deeply about the gospel. They're in fellowship. They're worshiping God. They're in Jerusalem. In times of change, Jesus is the same. Everything changes in life. Our lives are marked by change. But yet the things that matter do not change. Love, faithfulness, joy, loyalty, kindness, those things don't change. And most importantly, God does not change. Everything changes, and yet Jesus is the same. Everything changes, and yet nothing changes. Amen.